Here are the 10 most powerful races in D&D 5e. I figured we'd make this now before the updated rules drop this year and celebrate the things that are just unfairly powerful. Kobold. Yeah, the classic sniveling mob monster of D&D is actually awesome as a race. You are humanoid, small, 30 foot walking speed and have dark vision, which is always handy. But what makes kobolds really good is their two unique features. Draconic Cry lets you scream as a bonus action and somehow that gives you and all your allies advantage on all attacks against enemies within 10 feet of you until the start of your next turn. Advantage to everyone on every attack is great and this combos beautifully with rogues because you can use the bonus action to guarantee advantage which sets up your sneak attack. Screaming the words sneak attack as you sneak attack to get your sneak attack is exactly the type of big brain thinking I would expect from a kobold. You also get kobold legacy which gives you an option of three traits to pick. Craftiness gives you proficiency in one of these skills. Don't bother with this one, that's what backgrounds are for. Defiance gives you advantage on saving throws to avoid or end the frightened condition. Pretty handy, that's a condition that melee focused builds hate to have. But my favorite is Draconic Sorcery, giving you access to a free sorcerer cantrip. There are tons of great options here like Minor Illusion, Mage Hand, or Prestidigitation that anyone can enjoy. But the power game option is grabbing Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade and throwing them on your rogue for a massive power boost. Or Firebolt and throwing it on a Paladin for a fantastic range option, patching up pretty much the only weakness the Paladin class has. Shifter. It's basically werewolves but a race. Shifters are humanoid, 30 foot walking speed, medium sized, and have dark vision, which is always handy. You also get a free skill proficiency from this list, and of course, you can transform into a more powerful bestial form as a bonus action for one minute. When you shift, you gain temporary hit points equal to two times your proficiency bonus, and you get a bonus ability depending on the type of shifter you are. There are four types. Beast Hide is the tank. It gives you an additional 1d6 temporary hit points when you transform, and and a plus one bonus to your armor class. Barbarians, fighters, paladins, hell, even blade singer wizards can get a lot out of this one. Longtooth is my favorite. When you use a bonus action to transform, and again as a bonus action on subsequent turns, you can make an unarmed strike with your fangs, dealing 1d6 plus your strength modifier on a hit. This is crazy powerful on moon druids because you can shift into your shifter form even while wild shaped. Here's how the combo works. Be level two and wild shape into a brown bear. You now have 31 hit points and can attack twice as an action. Everyone knows how strong early game moon druids are. Next turn, bonus action shift into your long tooth form and bam, you're now even tankier than before and attacking three times a turn with your bear's very impressive 19 strength at level two. And that's just one combo. Basically any class that likes to attack lots goes great with this, barbarians especially. Swift Stride is the social distancing shifter. You can use a reaction when a creature ends its turn within five feet of you to just move 10 feet away without provoking opportunity attacks. Your walking speed also increases by 10 feet. This is pretty good on ranged builds who want to escape the reach of melee enemies so they can make their ranged attacks not at disadvantage. Finally, Wild Hunt gives you advantage on all wisdom checks and no creature within 30 feet of you can ever have advantage on attack rolls against you as long as you aren't incapacitated. This is cracked on barbarians who can just reckless attack every turn and completely ignore the disadvantage which usually means that all enemies have advantage on attack rolls against them. But if you're a wild hunt, you're fine. Owlin. So I made a rule, only two flying races can appear on this list. So here's Owlin, because they're the second best. Flight in D&D is just strong. We all know that fairies and Aarakocra are great, but Owlin stand out thanks to superior dark vision, which is always very handy. That is 120 feet of dark vision, which is good because most dark vision caps out at 60. That means you can attack at advantage with ranged weapons and spells in the dark, even if your target it has dark vision, as long as you're just more than 60 feet away. Not bad, although you'd really want something like proficiency in stealth to set that up, right? Oh wait, you totally get that. 
I will enhance proficiency in stealth. The only thing that would make this better is if you could do it all from the air, like hovering 70 feet above your enemies, raining down arrows invisibly on a group of terrified goblins. Oh wait, obviously you can fly. Owlin are just devastating ranged attackers. Rogues, fighters, rangers, and warlocks with Eldritch Blast, everything you need is right there. You can also be medium or small if you want to be extra cute, and you have a 30 foot walking speed. Just remember that you can't fly while wearing medium or heavy armor, but because you're a ranged build, you gotta be maxing out dexterity anyway, so it literally doesn't matter. Tables! What are they good for? Eating, sleeping, element, zinc, even to play games. Two. But watch out! Tables have evolved into the ultimate gaming form. The digital gaming table of the future is here, and it's touchscreen. Touch it. Say goodbye to traditional setups and embrace a new era of immersive storytelling with a game table that revolutionizes the way you play, offering dynamic maps, interactive character sheets, and endless customization possibilities built into the table. Crafted by Game Theory Tables and out now on Kickstarter, plus loads of other awesome game tables at a discount on the same Kickstarter. There's a table for any game and anybody. Get yours, link below. Warforged. Warforged are just like, they're just good, man. You are immortal, immune to magical aging, 30 foot walking speed, and medium sized, plus you get a bunch of fun abilities for being essentially a robot. You resist poison damage, have advantage on saves against being poisoned, don't need to eat, drink, or breathe. You're immune to disease, you don't even need to sleep, and magic can't put you to sleep. You can also long rest over the course of six hours of inactivity, during which time you are conscious, so you're just a free lookout every night for the party. You also gain one skill proficiency and one tool proficiency of your choice, and there are a ton of great options here. A thieves tools, a poisoners kit, a disguise kit, all great, and why not pick up proficiency in perception for all that nighttime watching that you're going to be doing. But wait, there's more. You also get integrated protection, which is basically just a flat plus one to your AC. This feature alone makes Warforged a top tier option for stupid AC builds, like Bladesinger Wizards and Artificers, and Sword and Shield Heavy Armor Fighters and Paladins. Shadar Kai. There are so many freaking elves in this game, and Shadar Kai are just like the edgy ones. You are humanoid, medium, 30 foot walking speed, and have dark vision which is always handy. You also get proficiency in perception, the best skill in the game, and you get all the usual elf benefits. Advantage on saves to avoid or end the charm condition, nasty condition. You don't need to sleep and magic can't put you to sleep, and you can finish a long rest in four hours if you spend those four hours meditating, during which time you remain conscious. Does this mean you can keep watch while meditating? Uh, I would say probably not, but it's something to think about. Four hour long rests are really good though. It means you can cast a bunch of long duration spells like Gift of Alacrity, Tiny Servant, Death Ward, and Mage Armor, and then have your four hour long rest regain back all those spell slots, and it's like they were cast for free. They'll last for the next four hours of adventuring. But wait, there's more. You also get to pick two proficiencies of your choice with any weapon or tool and gain them for a day after you finish a long rest. That lets you pick up key options like navigator's tools or thieves tools or a disguise kit. Basically, whatever your party is getting up to, you're going to be prepared and really good at it. The free weapon proficiency is also really good for monks, letting you gain proficiency with the longsword to use with your level 2 dedicated weapon feature. You've just elevated your monk from a D4 unarmed strike to a D10 longsword attack as their main monk weapon. But wait, there's even more, because Shadow Kai are resistant to all necrotic damage and they stole the Eldrin Elves' ability to teleport. As a bonus action, you can teleport up to 30 feet multiple times a day, but wait, there's even more, because from level 3 onwards, when you use this feature, you also gain a resistance to 
all damage until the start of your next turn. Shadokai are literally just this meme, but for every single type of elf. You'd think being so good, they wouldn't be so miserable all the time, but living in the Shadowfell will do that to a guy. Winged Tiefling, the second flyer on this list and the best flyer in the game. You are medium, humanoid, 30 foot walking speed and have dark vision, which is always handy. You also resist fire damage, which is honestly the best damage type to resist in the game outside of bludgeoning, slashing and piercing. And of course you have a 30 foot flying speed. So why are these guys better than the Owlin? Well, Winged Tieflings are the only race that can fly wearing medium armor. Everyone else needs light armor or nothing, which means this is the only flying race that works with builds that require medium armor, and therefore is a much more powerful niche than the Owlin's Dark Vision, the Fairy's Spellcasting, or the Aarakocra's Unarmed Strikes. Winged Tieflings are therefore the best flying option for Hexblade Warlocks, Paladins, Strength-based Fighters and Rangers, Clerics, or pretty much anyone who wants to fly and also can wear medium armor. This makes them the best flyers in the game. Unless I'd been lying to you and there was some terrible game design oversight which gave flying to three already incredibly powerful races, but that would never happen, right? Reborn, Hexblood, and Dampier. I'm bunching these three races together because damn it, they're all amazing and they all share the same broken trait. These options are lineages, which means you used to be a different race and then something happened and you became this. Reborn are zombies. You died and you came back. Hexblood, you became a hag. Dampier, you became a vampire. Functionally though, they all act as their own race, and you can start the game having already transformed into one from a previous race. Page 15, look it up if you don't believe me. We'll get to why that matters later, but first, let's talk about how great these races actually are. They're all medium or small, and they all get dark vision, which is always handy. Dampier get 35 foot walking speed, don't need to breathe, and can, from level three, walk on walls and ceilings leaving their hands free. Basically Spider-Man. They can also make attacks with their fangs, dealing 1d4 piercing damage on a hit. This is the only attack in the core rules of the games that uses constitution for its attack and damage modifier. Very fancy. In addition, when you bite someone, you gain a bonus equal to the piercing damage dealt, either to your next attack roll or ability check, or just as regained hit points. You can get this bonus a few times per long rest. Reborn, the zombie race, get 30 foot walking speed and have deathless nature. This means you have advantage on saves against being poisoned. You resist poison damage. You have advantage on death saves. You don't need to eat, drink, or breathe, and you don't need to sleep, and magic can't put you to sleep, and you can long rest in just four hours of sitting still. As before, four hour long rests are good. You also have knowledge from a past life. Whenever you make a skill check, you can just roll 1d6 and add it to the total. You just can, a few times per long rest. This makes reborn extremely reliable skill monkeys, and zombie monkeys are very funny. Finally, Hexblood have 30 feet of movement and can cast the spells Disguise Self and Hex once each for free per long rest. Both of those are great spells. Hex is a particularly nice option for fighters and monks, or anyone who makes lots of attacks. Hexblood also get the eerie token feature. Basically, you pop out a tooth and then you can communicate telepathically with anyone holding that tooth within 10 miles of you, or you can see through the location where you leave your tooth at. It's a role playability, but as far as role playabilities go, this one's pretty powerful. So all three of these races are great, but wait, there's more. They all share the ancestral legacy traits, which says if you replace a race with this lineage, i.e. you turn into one of these things, you keep any skill proficiencies and any flying, climbing, or swimming speed that race gave you. That means, in addition to everything that we just talked about, you can have been a former Owlin and have a 30 foot fly speed and proficiency in stealth. This is wild. Flying is very specifically only given to other races that don't have many abilities. That's just a balance thing, but giving it to all three of these hashtag spooky races makes them absolutely nuts. Although even without flying speed, 
they're still really good. Bugbear. Okay, that last entry was complicated. How about a race that's just good because it smacks the ever-loving balls off anyone it touches? You are medium, humanoid, 30-foot walking speed, and have dark vision, que siempre es útil. You also have fey ancestry, giving you advantage on saves to avoid or end the charmed condition, nasty condition, and powerful build, letting you lift, drag, or push heavier stuff. You're on that Sigma Goblinoid grind set. The sneaky skill also gives you advantage on stealth checks and lets you move through and stop in small spaces. It's pretty nice, but the real splashy features are the final two. Long limbs. When you make a melee attack roll on your turn, the reach for it is increased by five feet. This is just awesome. It lets you attack people from 10 feet away, even without a reach weapon, and then retreat away from them without provoking an opportunity attack because you're out side of their reach. It's just a great feature for pretty much any warrior build. But wait, there's more. There's also Surprise Attack, which says when you hit a creature that hasn't taken a turn yet, you deal an additional 2d6 damage. This is nuts. A level 2 monk can hit, use Flurry of Blows, hit twice again, all from 10 feet away, and deal 3d4 plus 6d6 plus 9 damage on their first turn. That's an average of 37.5. That's enough to easily one-shot a Black Dragon Wormling, a creature that's supposed to be a tough match for the entire party at that level. And of course it only gets better with extra attack, or fighters with action surge, or warlocks with Eldritch Blast, or Blade Singer Wizards with Steel Wind Strike. Yeah, this ability is actually ridiculous. You've just got to make sure that you go first. So remember to pump that dexterity score and take the alert feats to make the most of it. Custom Lineage and Variant Human. Of course, you all saw these coming. They're basically the same race. They each only give you a plus two to your ability scores at the start of the game, unlike pretty much every other race, which gives you a plus three. However, that doesn't matter. What makes these bad boys so powerful is that they give you a free feat. That's it. That's basically all they do, alongside a free skill proficiency. This is good because feats are good. This is better than pretty much any other racial trait in the game. Sure, flight is probably better than one feat. Bugbear's surprise attack is probably better than one feat. But the sheer versatility of having access to any feat in the game at level one is just unmatched. You want teleportation and spellcasting? Check out Fey Touched. You just want massive damage? Grab great weapon master or sharpshooter. If you want extra attacks, polearm master has you covered. If you want to be a skill monkey, just grab the skilled feet. If you want to be speedy, grab mobile. If you want to tank, grab tough. If you want to break the game, grab lucky. Remember, this is the only way in the game to grab a feat and not sacrifice your ability score increases. Sure, you could just grab Lucky at level 4 instead, but then you'd be giving up a plus 2 to your strength or whatever. So in that way, you can kind of look at this feature as a free plus 2 to your stats in addition to getting your build going 4 levels earlier, which is obviously fantastic. There's not much else to say here apart from the fact that you could take any build in the game and argue that this is the optimal race choice, and you'd probably be right. There's only one race that I think is better, and it's very close, but here it is. Mountain Dwarf. Okay, let's do this one more time. You are a humanoid, medium-sized, plus two to constitution, and have dark vision, which is always- <laughs> First of all, don't let that 25 foot walking speed depress you because it has a hidden bonus. As a dwarf, your movement speed cannot be reduced as a result of wearing armor. You also have resistance to poison damage and advantage on saving throws against poison. This is different from having advantage on saving throws against the poisoned condition, and it's arguably better. Example, you have advantage on saves against truth serum, and advantage on saves to avoid damage from creatures like the purple worm and the wyvern. You also have combat training, giving you proficiency with these four weapons. But thanks to Tasha's customizable origins, you can swap out those weapon proficiencies for any weapons you like. Yes, this can include guns. It also gives monks access to long swords, a nice ability that we discussed earlier. You also gain proficiency in artisan's tools, and again, thanks to Tasha's, you can change this to any tool proficiency that you want. Finally, you are very good at making history checks related to stonework. 
I'm not going to pretend that that is very good. But wait, there's more. Because that's just the stuff that all dwarves get access to. Mountain dwarves also get plus two to their strength and proficiency with light and medium armor. The astute among you will have noticed that this translates to a plus four four to your stats at level one. Every other race in the game, except for half elves, get a plus three at best. Thanks to Tasha's custom origins, once again, you can assign that plus four as two plus twos in any stats that you like. This is massive. There isn't a class in the game that wouldn't love the extra stats. Monks get to start with a plus three in both wisdom and dexterity. Paladins get to start with a plus three in both strength and charisma. But also, that free armor proficiency is just crackers. Suddenly, your wizard, who previously had to make do with no armor at all, can strap on half plates for an AC of 17 with only 14 in their dexterity. This lets them put more stats into constitution, letting them, you know, not die. The same goes for warlocks and sorcerers. It's just free real estate. Medium armor proficiency also opens up options for strength-based rogues, an entire archetype Type that's really fun and is enabled pretty much exclusively by this race. Also, your wizard or whoever that wants to take one level in cleric to pick up heavy arm proficiency can do so and not need to worry about their strength score because being a dwarf means your speed can't be reduced from wearing heavy armor. I think any of the top four entries in this list could be argued to be the strongest, but as we all know, any race in the right situation and right builds can be really good, except possibly standard human. We kind of suck. If the entire back catalogue of this channel says anything, it's that you can do cool stuff in this game, no matter who you are. Remember to check out the D&D Short Patreon to grab hundreds of pages of amazing 5e material in the form of beautiful monthly magazines. Including stuff like the brand new Unseen Warlock, an incredible spin on the class which draws from the power of your allies to strike down your enemies. If you sign up today, you get the last three months magazines in instantly for free, plus a free bonus issue, and you get to support the channel. I've linked that in the description below. Also remember to like and subscribe, check out other videos on the channel, and uh, yeah, that's all I got. I'll see you next time.